Uh, today, we're, today, we're fortunate enough to have Marissa Friedrich. Uh, she heads up our tax controversy group. Uh, it is really a plethora of knowledge uh, related to tax, tax audits, sales tax, residency issues. And uh, I think she's got a, a great presentation today, a good smattering, a little bit of everything. Um, so I guess with that, I will turn it over to Marissa and we will uh, get started here. Great. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Alan. Um, just to start some housekeeping, if you'd like to leave a question, please do so in the chat. We'll try to address everyone's questions at the end or throughout the presentation as we see fit. Um, but yeah, absolutely feel free to uh, drop any questions there or you can reach out to us afterwards at another time if you want to discuss something further. All right, so welcome. We're going to first start off the the, the bulk of this um, presentation is on residency matters as they pertain to New York State, but we thought we'd just cover a couple of other topics that we also handle here at CPL, one of which is IRS and New York State collections. Um, there are various ways in the the which the IRS can collect against an individual or a business. They can garnish someone's wages. Levies are a big one. You do get advance notice with the IRS and when they are going to levy you on your bank account, um, you do have rights to appeal that, that levy, that decision um, that the IRS is making against you. Um, the levy is a snapshot of the funds that are in your bank account at that time. It's not you know, an ongoing levy as we'll discuss with like New York State. There are federal tax liens that can be implied, applied against you and you do have appeal rights there. And a big one is passport revo revocation, especially if you're one that travels a lot. Um, if you owe more than $59,000 um, to the IRS and that gets adjusted annually, they can revoke or deny issuance of a passport to you. Um, so there's you know, definitely some implications there if you're in that boat. Okay. <laughs> If you do have some collection action or you do have a, a, a balance with the IRS, there's several payment alternatives available to you if you cannot full pay your balance. You can apply for a penalty abatement. The IRS does offer a first time penalty abatement, really no questions asked. There are some you know, pre, um, you know, parameters you have to meet in order to get that first time penalty abatement. Um, however, if you don't apply for the first time, uh, penalty abatement, you can apply for relief due to reasonable cause. Um, there are installment agreements, that's essentially payment over time, you pay on a monthly basis. Sometimes financial information is needed for approval there, but know that interest and penalties continue to accrue. Most with any type of payment arrangement you have with the, with the IRS, um, interest does continue to accrue until the balance is paid. Offers and compromise, it's not pennies on the dollar. It's actually an agreement between the taxpayer and the IRS. You're settling the liability for a lower amount, and it's based on a calculation of your net equity and assets plus your future earning potential. And that will fully resolve all your outstanding liabilities. Again, there's many terms and conditions you must meet, uh, but that's a great um, avenue for some people that really do not have many assets or much in terms of income. Currently not collectible is you agree you owe something to the IRS, but you really cannot pay because of your current financial situation. The IRS will then monitor to you perhaps in a year to see if you're still in that situation. Next. New York State collection, it's pretty much the same as the IRS with some, some variations. Um, liens are called warrants. Uh, it's public record uh, of a judgment. It's a perfected lien. You do get notice after the warrant is filed. So you have no uh, way to appeal that or try and fight against that warrant being filed. Levies, um, there are bank levies. Again, there's no notice given to you. And it's an ongoing levy. It continues on for 90 days from the date the levy starts. Um, so if you're continuing to put money into your New York State bank account, guess what? It goes to the state. There are third-party levies. They can come against merchant providers, tenants, receivables. Um, income execution, that's limited to 10% of a taxpayer's gross earnings, much like the, the wage garnishment. And the New York State doesn't have a passport, but they have a driver's license suspension program. And that really gets a lot of people to the table. If you owe more than $10,000 in, 
in tax, um, penalty and interest, you will get your driver's license suspended. You can apply for uh, a restricted license or show um, undue hardship and try to get that license reenacted. But if you do enter into one of the next uh, payment options, you can get that driver's license reinstated. Um, some payment alternatives, again, much like the IRS, you have penalty abatement. There is no first time penalty abatement. There's only that due to reasonable cause, installment agreements, offers and compromise, all basically the same. But a great program that New York State has that the IRS really doesn't have is a voluntary disclosure program. And it allows people who are non-filers, who have made mistakes and have now noticed those errors to come forward to the state and say, I'm sorry, made a mistake or haven't filed. Please don't um, um, impose any penalties on me. Please don't refer me for criminal and I'll pay the tax and interest. And it's a great program for people who are non-filers. Before we get into New York State sales tax, I guess a little takeaway from this federal and state tax liens, tax warrants, is communicating with the IRS, communicating with the state. You, you know, a lot of people, it's amazing, and Marissa's filled me in, a lot of wealthy people are non-filers. They don't file at all. And at some point, the IRS and the state will catch up with you. So if you get a notice, please, I know so many people almost think you'll throw it away and it won't come back again. These notices keep coming back and they keep accruing with interest and penalties. You know, Marissa has been amazing. She's able to negotiate with the IRS. Interest will still accrue. Perhaps she gets penalties waived or penalties pulled so they stop charging you penalties. There's so many things you can do by communicating with the, with, with the IRS or the state. I think so many people avoid it because it's one of these things you don't want to know from. But I think ultimately the best message from this is it can get a little difficult uh, the longer you let something go, for sure. Very true. Um, don't ignore those envelopes. Open those envelopes, address them quickly. It'll avoid a lot of hassle in the end. Um, this is another thing we handle a lot of our sales tax and planning and audits. New York State has a sales tax and it's imposed on tangible personal property unless it's specifically exempt or services that are um, generally exempt unless they're specifically listed. So it's kind of the opposite. It's a trust fund tax. You're really just the intermediary. You're collecting the tax and then it's your duty to submit that to the state. Um, there's no willfulness requirement. There's no duty requirement for general partners and LLC members. Um, it's on the entire liability that goes to a responsible person. That's essentially the person that has been entrusted with handling the sales tax for the company or the owner of the company. And there's certain you know, um, indicia to see who is a responsible person. But essentially, if you're the owner, if you're the one preparing the sales tax return, you're collecting the sales tax you are a responsible person and you can be held personally responsible for those uh, for the sale unpaid sales tax. The sales tax audits are document intensive. It's a great um, thing to keep all your records for a minimum of three years. Just keep all those records, keep all your invoices, all your receipts, all your tax returns, um, because you just don't know if you're going to be audited for sales tax in New York State. Just a little tidbit I'll throw in there on, on sales tax. If you're a real estate person, real estate broker involved in real estate, sometimes, a lot of times in these apartments and these deals that we do, homes, people leave personal property, right? Real property is the actual building, the condominium unit, the co-op unit. Those are shares. That's personal to you. But if you include personal property in a contract, the concern is that New York State will want to charge sales tax, right? The buyer pays the sales tax. So always be careful when you're including personality. Sometimes we do a side letter. There should be a good discussion with a lawyer on how we structure that, because if you include too much of the purchase price in personality, that amount is subject to sales tax. Person, any kind of uh, sale of personality would require sales tax. All right. All right, let's get into it now. My favorite. <laughs> Uh, domicile and residency rules. This is a very, very hot topic right now. Uh, many, many people are leaving New York State um, and they're not just leaving for tax purposes. Um, obviously there's many states that have no income tax and you'll see a lot of New Yorkers flooding those states. States like Tennessee and Florida and Texas. Um, but they're also leaving for other reasons, lower crime rates, favorable business climates, and obviously better weather. 
Um, so in totality, um, a lot of these benefits are prompting people to leave the state for sunny pastures. And the state, New York State, uh, being as aggressive as it is, does not really like to let people leave, especially those that are high net worth individuals, those people that have been very good customers over the you know, past several years, those are the ones they really wanna hold on to. So let's get into it. What does New York State deem as a resident? So you're a resident if you meet one of two tests, a domicile test or a statutory residency test. Domicile test has several factors that you would have to meet to determine where is your domicile. And you can only have one domicile, whereas you can have many residences. It's the place where you return. It's the place you call home. And the burden of proof in claiming a change of domicile is on the party claiming the change. So in most cases of people leaving New York, it's on that taxpayer to show by clear and convincing evidence that they have left the state. And it's by showing all those factors, which we'll get into later on. The residency test, the statutory residency test is a two-part test. It really says if you're a non-resident, so you're not a domiciliary of New York, you live somewhere else, but you maintain a permanent place of abode for substantially all of the year in New York State, and you meet, spend more than 183 days in the state during that calendar year, you're deemed a statutory resident. Well, what does that all mean? Well, you are then taxed on your worldwide income to New York State. And if furthermore, if you're in New York City, now you're a New York City resident and subject to New York City tax. So understanding the rules and not confounding the two are very, very important. So we're going to get into it now. Domicile test. Like I said, intent is key. Where do you want to live? Where is the place that you call home and that you intend to constantly return when you leave? And there's only one domicile. Like I said, there's many residences. Um, it's a great test also for New York State, uh, New York estate tax. New York has an estate tax. We're going to use Florida for the purposes of this webinar just for ease. But for example, Florida does not have an estate tax. So it's another reason that prompts many people to want to leave the state. Okay, changing your domicile, your old domicile, so your domicile in New York will continue until you've established a new one in a new domicile. You have to abandon and sever those ties to the old domicile and establish those in the new one, okay? Establishing just your intent is difficult and it's very subjective. So the state has put in place five factors which are objective to show that subjective intent to wanna to leave the state. And like I said, the burden of proof is on the person claiming the change of domicile. And once you have to just show domicile change one time, Statutory residency is an annual test. Again, we'll discuss that later. So here are the five factors, home, business, time, items near and dear, and family. Home is a comparative analysis. It looks to a comparison of the home in New York versus the home in the new domicile in Florida. And they'll look at square footage and fair market value, but more importantly, it's what is the use of the property? How are you using the two properties, especially if you're maintaining one or can, will continue to maintain a property in New York? How are each being used? Furthermore, be, be, beyond the actual physical dwelling, we look to see your involvement in the new community. Have you severed all your ties in New York, where perhaps you went to gym there, you had a country club membership, um, your kids did horseback riding lessons or whatever the case may be, you've now established those in the new domicile. And perhaps there's an activity that you could not do in New York that now you're very anxious or looking forward to doing in the new domicile, obviously join those things there and document those as well. And also where are holidays important then celebrated? That's very important. The state looks to see where you're spending holidays and important events to you that are within your control um, and if they're being spent in New York or in Florida. Business activities. Do you have an active business involvement in the state, in, in New York State? Um, movement to, you, you may have to move your business to the new domicile if it's an active business. If you have a passive investment, that's okay. Time spent, it's a significant shift in your lifestyle pattern. It's a comparison between your time in New York versus a new domicile. 
If you have another residence in another state in Maine or California, you spend a lot of time there. You have to be careful because you can be spending more time in New York in that scenario. And you want to try and avoid that. Items near and dear. Those are those items of sentimental and monetary importance to you. So tracking where those items are is important. So get moving bills, make sure you have those insurance policies where the items of value are being kept. Family connections, historically, it's where the minor children attend school. Um, the state wants to make sure that the family is together. Um, location of immediate family is also asked in the, in the case where there are no minor children involved. Here's some other factors. So most people, you ask them, well, how do you move your domicile? How do you change your domicile in New York? And they'll say, well, I got a driver's license and I have a place there. And they believe that's sufficient. And unfortunately, um, that is not sufficient. Um, these other factors are great to do. So registering to vote, getting your driver's license, registering your car, doing that declaration of domicile, all those things are great but they will not be determinative of a change of domicile. The five factors we mentioned briefly before are the ones that are looked to in change of domicile analysis. Next. Right. Um, here's some non-factors. You can read them. It's pretty straightforward. Next. Now we're gonna go a little bit deeper into each of the factors. So home. You can only again have one true home. So it's, that's why I say it's very important to look to the nature of the use of the home. So the home in Florida should be the one that's the primary residence and treat it as such. So if you're adding something to, you wanna add something to a house or you wanna add a pool, you're going to do that in Florida. You're not going to do that to the home that perhaps you've retained in New York. And if you haven't retained any, anything in New York, it's really not an issue. But in the event that you do, you really want to make sure that the home that in New York is being used as a vacation or hoteling spot and anything of, of sizable construction or addition is being done to the home in Florida. Next. Active business involvement. Again, are you actively participating in the day-to-day -day operations of a New York business? And if you are, that's a problem. That can essentially be a problem for you. And there's ways in which we can get around it. You can try and put in some type of management company um, so that you're not directly involved with the New York business. Um, but New York State will look to see what your involvement is. If you're a W-2 employee of a New York company, then there's potential exposure for that income to be taxable to New York. And we'll discuss that later on but you have to just be very careful in the way in which your business is structured for, for, for these purposes. Active business, I, I, next, next screen, sorry. Sorry, Alan. Time spent. Okay, this is another one that most people get uh, confused with statutory residency. Again, most people will say, well, I haven't been in New York for more than 183 days, or it, I haven't been there for six months in a day, and they believe that's sufficient. That is not the rule when it comes to domicile. That's the rule for statutory residency. For time spent in a domicile change, they look at your living pattern and want to see that there's a significant shift in that living pattern such that you're spending a lot more time in the new domicile in Florida than you are in New York. And like I mentioned, if you do have a third uh, resident or a fourth, you can essentially be spending more time in New York than Florida if you're spending a lot of time in those places or you vacation a lot. So it's very important to keep track of your time and your days. And that's done through cell phone records, keeping diaries and calendars. There's apps you can download on your phone now. It's very important to be um, very cognizant of where your time is being spent. And obviously spend more time in Florida than, than you can. Six months in a day is not going to cut it. items near and dear. Those are, again, it's called the teddy bear test. And it's those items of sen sentimental monetary significance to you. And those are items such as photo albums or videos, or maybe family heirlooms. And items of monetary significance, think artwork, wine collections, maybe you're a car collector, um, jewelry, those items should all be moved to Florida. They should not be kept in the home in New York. They should not be kept in storage in New Jersey. They should be moved to the new location. And the easiest way to do that 
is getting a moving tr moving truck and having them delineate in the moving bill that which is being moved. And then furthermore, any of those items that are of significant value, you add them to the insurance policy of the new home. Family connections. Again, like I said, this is really to make sure the family unit is together in the new domicile. There, I have had many cases where we have husband and wives or same-sex partners that live separate lifestyles. And that's okay. You just have to have the documentation to show that, um, that that lifestyle is one that they want and that they foster. Um, let's see. Um, so <laughs> occasionally, uh, historically, this went to where the minor children attended school. They want to see that the minor children are not attending school in New York and that they're attending school in the um, new domicile. Just go back one slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so adult and college age children does not necessarily mean the parents are domiciled in New York. And as of late, the state has been asking, where are your grandparents, where are your siblings, where are your parents, and where are grandchildren? Because those are all ties back to New York if that's where they're located. Nice. Again, it's an overall pattern of life, looking to see if you become part of the community. How has your life been affected other than the primary factors? They look to see at your hobbies, social outlets, anything that where you might be spending your time. And the biggest takeaway from this is documenting everything, documenting your intent to want to leave New York, simply sending an email to family and friends. Hey, I'm leaving the state. Here's my new address. I'll be living in Florida from this point forward um, to canceling those memberships here in New York, keeping that documentation, starting it anew in the new domicile, keeping track of your days, keeping all the records with of uh, selling your home, any construction done to the new home, et cetera, et cetera. Now we're gonna move on to statutory residency. This is the other way in which New York State can tax an individual. And these are most like people that live in say Connecticut or New Jersey or some other state. They're domiciled there, there's no doubt about it but they have a home or a an apartment or something in the state that may be, subject them to the statutory residency test. And that, like I said, is a two-part test. And the first part of the test is, do you maintain a permanent place of abode in New York for substantially all of the year? Now, if you don't meet that first part of the test, there's no reason to go to the second part of the test. So if you're someone who lives in Connecticut, doesn't have a home here in New York, but spends more than 183 days in New York because you work here, you're not subject to the statutory residency rules. However, if you do get something in New York, and we'll discuss the various things that qualify for permanent place of abode, um, you may be subjecting yourself to taxation on not just income earned in New York, but worldwide income. So it's important to understand the rules. So what's a permanent place of abode? Well, we look at the physical attributes. So is it habitable for year-round use? Does it have cooking and bathing facilities? And most places do, and most places will qualify as a PPA. The other part of it that we have to look at is do you have a residential interest in the property? And this is where it gets tricky, where you have people that um, buy places for family members or they're on the lease um, for a place for their child attending university in New York City or purchasing a home, uh, an apartment for their child. You have to be very, very careful in those cases because you may be subjecting your whole income uh, to statutory residency and being subject to New York State tax. So examples of a PPA, vacation homes, unfurnished residences, homes kept for a relative. Again, that's a big one. That's a shocker for most people in that I don't live there, that's for my mom, it's just in my name, or that's for my child attending college, I don't live there. But the state's going to look to see if you have a residential interest in that property. And we're gonna talk about what that means in a minute. Um, putting something in a trust is not going to change the analysis. Trusts don't live in houses, trusts don't live in apartments, people do. So they, you know, break through that trust, <laughs> um, facade and they see to see who's actually living there, who has the unfettered access to the place, 
where are the per whose personal effects are in the apartment? And again, if it's for a relative, you too can be subjecting yourself um, to taxation in New York. Substantially all of the year, it, as of 2022 and forward means 10 months or more. So let's take an example. You live in Connecticut, you purchase an apartment in May in New York City. Do you have a permanent place of abode um, in 2024, if it's May of 2024? No, you do not. You did not meet the first part of the test. You can come to New York 365 days. You do not meet the first part of the test. However, let's go to 2025. You have that apartment for the entire year. You do meet that, that substantial of the year qualification and therefore you can go to the second part of the test. Next. Here's what I was discussing before about what's your relationship to the dwelling. Um, do you contribute to the household? Are you the owner of the property? Do you have unfettered access? Do you have a copy of the keys? Are you able to come and go as you please? What is your relationship to the habitants? Are they your children? Is it a lease where you have you own the property, but you have a third party legal document in place that leases that property to someone else? That removes you from the statutory residency, the first part of the test. Do you have a dedicated room? Is your stuff there? You know, are you keeping your toothbrush and a change of clothes there? Again, that can make that your PPA. Are you send, getting your mail sent there? All important things to consider. So that was the first part of the test. The second part of the test is, do you spend more than 183 days in the state? Well, what is a day? Do you mean I have to spend 24 hours in New York? No, a minute in New York counts as a day. Any time you come to New York counts as a day. There is no exception for shopping or dining. And there's some limited exceptions if you're coming for medical procedures or if you're just traveling through the state. Next. <clears throat> if you're traveling through the state, it's a little different situation. Are you coming, but a further analysis has to be done. Are you literally traveling through the state where you're going from maybe Connecticut to Pennsylvania or New Jersey and you're just driving right through, then that doesn't count as a day. However, if you're traveling through and you stop and you have lunch or you visit your apartment that's there just to check in on it, guess what? You've just subjected yourself to a day. Again, if you're flying from another state through JFK to, to fly internationally and you have a long layover and you decide to go eat at your favorite restaurant in Queens, well, you just subjected yourself to a day. If you stay in JFK, that day doesn't count. So the details are important. Medical treatment in New York, only if you're an inpatient and only the person that is the patient. So if you're an inpatient um, you're having an inpatient procedure. Those days do not count towards the uh, one, uh, 183 day rule. However, your spouse that's waiting for you there, her days or his days would count. The burden of proof for statutory mm -hmm. residency is on the taxpayer. You must show by clear and convincing evidence your whereabouts on any given day in the whole year. That's why documentation is so very key with statutory residency. We often advise people to keep not only an app and a digital copy of their whereabouts, but also paper copies, paper calendars, keeping app, uh, paper copies of credit card statements, your cell phone records, as well as digital. It's great to have it in two places because I've done this for 20 years and I've seen both disappear. So if you have a backup that that's you know, very key. Now they have these apps for cell phones. It's great. You can download them and they keep track of uh, your days, regardless of the state. They'll tell you if you're getting close to a statutory residency um, situation in the state in which you're in. Any unknown days go to New York. So if you don't have documentation, um, you're out of luck. Here are some types of evidence, like I said, calendar di diaries, Contemporaneous evidence, I cannot stress that enough, is so key. It just holds so much more weight than something that's produced or um, made up, not made up in the sense of that it's false, but generated um, when the audit is ongoing. If it's from now, that's 
the best documentation you can have. You can show pattern of life. You can use credible testimony. We don't really like to go there, but you use cell phone records, credit cards, easy pass, any type of data secure, uh, security data that you can get from swipe card records, bank records. Um, and again, you have to watch for false positives. Um, we had the situation where um, the state was relying on cell phone records for a day count for a client of mine. And um, he was clearly in Connecticut um, at 10.06 and he pinged to a tower on Long Island at 10.08. Now that's a pretty fast boat and I don't think that's possible. Um, the state finally acquiesced that day, um, but they had held that as a New York day that he had been in New York for, for literally two minutes. Um, they held that as a New York day. So you have to be very careful with false positives. That's a big one, cell phone records. Yeah, cell phone records, like here it says, the reliability is based upon the strongest tower. It's not necessarily the, the tower that's closest to you. So you can be on the border of Connecticut and New York and pinging to a New York tower unbeknownst to you. That's why it's very important to have lots of evidence, not relying just on one piece of evidence. If you have something showing where you, you, you're at at that time, where a cell phone in, you know, incorrectly places you in New York and you have something else showing that you're in Connecticut, that would be great. It's not always possible. You have to look at the whole picture, all the evidence put together. It's really you know, an investigative uh, puzzle, you're putting together a puzzle of trying to determine where the taxpayer is at the time. If you have lots of documentation contemporaneously, it should go more smoothly. Next. Okay. This case, I, I throw it out there. It's very, very specific, but I, I had a case that happened to fall within the exact same fact pattern as the Obis case. So I want to throw it out there. The Obis case was Mr. Obis lived in New Jersey. He worked in New York City. He had a little tiny um, cottage upstate New York, about four or five hours away from uh, where he worked. And um, he only went there for a few weeks a year. His wife hated going there. Anytime he went, he took his stuff with him and then he took all his stuff home. And he called up the neighbor and said, hey, don't shoot me when I come there, because apparently it's shooting um, area. And he said, please don't shoot me when I come up there. I'm coming up there. It's me. Don't shoot me. So we don't know exactly what the appellate division looked to here, if they took all the facts together, if they were just focusing on one more than the other. They don't make it very clear in the decision, but they held this not to be a permanent place of abode. Now, if you live in New Jersey and you work in, in New York City and you have a home or a cottage in the Hamptons, um, this may not work. Um, I really think a lot of the fact, the biggest factor here is the distance wise that he could not commute daily from the place or had the ability to use that as a primary residence or some type of you know, day to day residence. So if your fact pattern is the same, great, you can use it. I was able to use it. My client won his case based on this, um, but it's not doable in all circumstances. Okay, so now allocate the income. Allocation of income. So this is what I say is kind of sort of the third way in which the state can tax an individual. Domicile is one, statutory residency is the other. Now, let's just say you're not a domiciliary of New York. You don't have a statutory residency situation. However, you work for a New York employer. So if you're a non-resident and you have an employer that's a New York employer and you work for that New York employer, that income is subject to New York state taxation, regardless of where you work. So if you're working from your home in New Jersey for that New York employer, and that's, this happened a lot during the COVID, COVID years, many people were working from home, unbeknownst to them, thinking that they're now their income wasn't subject to New York tax because they weren't physically coming to work, their, their income was subject to tax. And we've seen a lot, a lot of audits um, that are looking to see if at the income was being allocated appropriately. Obviously, if you're a non-resident, you do not work for a New York company, but you do work in New York, you would allocate those days worked in New York over your total number of days worked for the year, and that percentage would, would be allocable to New York. 
Right. And I think with more people working remote, we'll start seeing these calculations and this litigation being done more and more for sure. Right. Okay. I mean, the only really way out of it is to make, if you go to the next slide, Alan, the only way really out of it is you have to show you have a bona fide employer office at your location, at your home, essentially. And that's a lot of factors involved there. You have to show either a primary factor, which almost no one meets, or two, two of six secondary factors and three of 10 tertiary factors. And they're very specific. And, you know, you need to have your employer really on board very, very difficult, not, not that it's not attainable, it's just very difficult to show. You really have to have an employer that's willing to work with you. And, and the employer should also know that may expose them then to Nexus if they're establishing you know, a telecommuting location or a business location in another state. Um, the other way you could do is, is just ask your, your, um, your employer to move you to a local office. So if you have moved to say Florida, um, ask your, your employer to move you to the Florida office if one were to exist. Um, that way that should remove you from being taxable to New York unless you're working any days physically in New York. Awesome. And that's about it. I think we have a few questions in the chat. I, I don't know, you want, shall we look, Alan? Yep, I'm just gonna get out of the sharing of the screen. I can't see the chat for some reason. I don't see the chat. Hold well, on, stop sharing. I'll just do that right now. Okay, the chat. We have a chat. All right. I wasn't able to see it when I should the screen. Here we go. We'll start at the top. Has the issue of passport denial and revocation for owing the IRS money been challenged? So is, if you owe the IRS money, the, uh, one of their, so their resources is to hold back your passport or your driver's license. Marissa, that's correct. Right. right. And I don't know if that's been challenged in some way, shape or form constitutionally or through litigation, but it is an ongoing process that's available and the IRS is continuing to do it. It does adjust the amount um, from inflation year to year. Um, it has caused a lot of issues for several of my clients who do have balances and they are either stuck in another country um, and they need to come back or they have an impending trip. And there's a lot of documentation that needs to be put together quickly um, to get to the Department of State and to the IRS to work together to release that so that you can get your passport. But in terms of any type of litigation or anyone challenging that on a constitutional basis, I'm not aware of that. No, I think, I think part of the constitution is paying taxes. So to the extent you owe taxes, that I don't think that's unconstitutional. But frankly, you know, I recently had a deal where I got a call from uh, a buyer's agent that had a, a buyer, someone from Connecticut that was looking to buy an apartment here in New York City for six million dollars. And it was a three bedroom. And when she called me to represent the buyer, I said to her, you know, I'd like to speak to the buyer about residency issues. If this buyer who has a residency in Connecticut where there's no state tax bought an apartment in New York City. And it was a three bedroom and the IRS would say, hey, one of those bedrooms could be for you, even though he was buying it for his daughter. And Marissa could kind of go through this. That taxpayer could have his worldwide income. If he's here more than 180 days taxed in New York City and New York State. And I said to the broker, I want to speak to the client about this. And the broker started saying to me, well, you know what, Alan, I'd rather not say a word. I don't want to damage their ability to buy a place. It took it a little bit, but I got the broker to, to kind of get on board with me. I spoke to the client about it. And because of his situation not being in New York and him keeping track of his days, he was able to buy this place and consciously know that he had to stay 180 days out of New York. Remember, because he worked in New York, days coming in, going straight to the office would count as part of his 180 days. So Marissa, maybe you can give just a little color, but anyway, yeah. the, the buyer was so happy that we gave him the ability to speak to Marissa. Both the broker and I got like accolades, the whole deal. Just the idea that we kind of, opened his eyes, kind of got credibility with the buyer by bringing Marissa into the fold here. But Marissa, explain that concept, that Connecticut buyer yeah. buying in New York City for his daughter who's going to live with a couple friends in an apartment. Right. So so knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. It's, it, it, there's no doubt about it. Knowing the rules and knowing how to protect yourself is so key. And like I said, contemporaneous documentation is best. You do not want to be blindsided three years from now, two years from now with an audit, and you have no records 
Um, you know, I can understand the frustration of the broker, but ultimately we're all working for the client. And having them well prepared in these situations is important. So if you do not live in New York, and I've spoken to probably about 20 people in the past two or three weeks that are in this situation, they do not live in New York. They have no intention of coming to New York. So there's no domicile question here. It's statutory residency, which I've said before is a two-part test. And I see someone asked, is the burden of proof always on the taxpayer is always on the taxpayer. The taxpayer has a burden of proof to show that they have or they do not have a residential interest in a property, and they have the burden of proof to show their date count, to show their whereabouts on any given day in the calendar year, and it's an annual test. So if you have this person who is not a domicile of New York, they live in another state, they're clearly purchasing an apartment for their child's use only, there's a problem there because you will have unfettered access. You have a res residential interest in the property of ownership rights, or if it's a lease, you have you know that, that financial responsibility there. But the underlying, if you peel away the layers, your child's never going to not let you into the apartment, it's yours. And so the state will want to see whether or not you have your personal effects there. They will come and interview the doorman. They've done this before or surrounding areas or neighbors to see whether or not you're coming there. They will look to see your, your cell phone records to see if you are making calls or surfing or whatever you're scrolling through the internet on your phone um, at nighttime and then early in the morning so that you know one can assume that you've slept there overnight. And if this goes on over a period of time, they're going to attribute that as a PPA to you, satisfying that first part of the test. And like Alan said, if you're here for more than 183 days, you just caused a whole boatload of problem for yourself. Um, so it's very key if you are not um, staying in that apartment to make it very clear. And there's various techniques that one can use. There's no guarantee the state will accept them, but make sure that you know, there's a, maybe an understanding between you and your child in some written form that you will give a certain number of no, days notice before coming, that you do not have unfettered access. Take pictures with date stamps showing that your stuff isn't there. And the best thing that you could possibly do is if they have a roommate and it's a one bedroom or a two bedroom, there's no room for you. I mean, that's just logical. Um, however, if it's a three bedroom, it's only your child staying there it's a little bit more problematic to show that you do not have a residential interest in that property. If it's a studio, it's pretty much a slam dunk. Again, you still would have to show that you don't have unfettered access and your stuff isn't there and that your child is always staying there. You're not there you know, in the summers when they're not using it. So keeping track of your days helps with that because it shows where your whereabouts are and that you're not coming to New York and that you're not here. So it's very key. If you can't prove the first part, the second and the second part's all that you have, the day count, keep immaculate records as to where you're where you are on a given day. Um, these slides will be shared. We could we'll share them. We'll have Dana share these with everybody that, that attended. Um, does the taxpayer always have the burden of proof of disproving statutory residence? So can you prove that you do not have a dwelling in New York? How can you prove that on a date where there's no record of you have been in New York and did enter New York? However, briefly, is there some threshold that the state must meet? So I guess the question is, who has the burden of proof? And as it's the always taxpayer, the taxpayer. It's if the taxpayer, the taxpayer has the burden, what can you do to prove, I guess, your calendar? What is it besides, I know there's apps that people use. The a lot apps. Of people there's use the apps. one called Tax Day, Tax Bird, Moneo. Those are great. They do track your, your whereabouts. Again, you're proving a negative in some cases, which is, you know, pretty, it's not fair. Um, unfortunately, these are the rules and we have to, you know, we have, you have, you have the burden of proof to show that you are not meeting them. So again, you're proving a negative. So keep um, intense documentation, um, any receipt, any cell phone record that you may have, credit card statements, um, if there are swipe card records into any building that you go to outside of New York to show that you couldn't possibly be there, travel documentation. If you know you live in California, you obviously aren't driving to New York, 
So you must have some type of travel documentation. Keep those boarding passes. Make copies, you know, print them out. Don't just keep them on your phone. Print them out. Scan them into your computer. Keep a physical copy. I always tell people, be prepared. Keep a file on, on a bookshelf somewhere. It's your insurance policy when this, if this were to come up. Um, um, next the question. five factors proving main domicile. Okay, so to change your domicile, the five factors briefly are home, right? The comparative analysis of your home, most importantly, the use, getting into the community, the new community, um, business involvement. Are you maintaining um, the day-to-day -day operations of a business in New York? The third is time spent. Again, it's not the 183 days rule that we just discussed about in statutory residency. It's more of a significant shift in your lifestyle pattern, right? Um, family connections, where's your family, essentially? And uh, items near and dear, where are those items that are important to you? Where, where are their location? Those are the five. Um, one item I think I wanted to share with everyone, if you live in New York, and if your adjusted gross income is over, let's say $200,000, and then you decide you're not going to file a tax return this year because you claim you moved to Florida, the odds are like 85% that the IRS is going to send you a paper notice to prove some points to make sure you did leave New York. And as your adjusted gross income rises to, say, seven figures, a million or more, or multiple millions, you're going to get a full audit. I know people, we have clients that it's happened to every day. So it's so critical that you plan your leave from New York. And if it's done, for lack of a better word, kind of half-assed by somebody, especially <laughs> someone that has like a liquidity event in the year where they're selling a business and they're getting $20 million. We see it happen to many of our clients. It's so critical that that's planned out the right way because New York right. assumes you're in New York. And unless you can prove it by the apps or other records, you're going to be in some hot water and you're going to end up settling with New York even though you weren't in New York, maybe at all during the year. I see it happen all the time. So it's right. so important that we get our clients, whether they're buying or selling, whether they're leasing. Tell us a little bit, Marissa, about the system New York uses so that if I lease a three bedroom, I live in Connecticut or I live in New York State, I lease a three bedroom in New York City for my kid or I use it as a pit of tail. I work in New York, I'm gonna sometimes stay in the apartment. What happens, because New York City residency is a 4% tax. Right. So on your overall income. So people that live in New York State in Westchester or Nassau County don't want to be city residents. And by leasing a little pit of tear, the IRS or New York State rather has the ability to connect the tenant lease and the individual taxpayer. Right. So there's a lot of reporting that goes on. And this even goes back to, say, the sales tax audit. You may be picked for a sales tax because of someone else that had a sales tax audit and you came up as a vendor and they start looking at you. So it's not necessarily anything you can avoid. It's just through their system, which is a very sophisticated system. It's called the KISS system, C-I-S-S. -S. And there's various reporting in between um, the various departments within the state. Um, so anything that may get reported by the landlord um, to the state, that gets shared with the Department of Taxation and Finance. And then there's someone there that's going to inquire. And like Alan said too, with audits, um, if they see that you've changed your residency status, you are constantly filing as a resident of New York, and now all of a sudden you haven't filed, or you now filed as a non-resident, that's going to make bells and whistles go off, and someone's going to look further into you, and then inquire and say, is it worth our resources to further inquire into this, into this taxpayer? And they're going to say, yeah, we're going to do a desk audit, which is those computer-generated audits that they send pieces of paper and say, send all this information to this black hole number, or you get a, a field audit, which is a three person team that reviews your information. And remember, your audit isn't happening the day after or two days after your change of domicile. Usually it happens one, two, three years later. And so that's why, again, I stress about having contemporaneous documentation is that you have it now. And then in three years, you may have misplaced something you don't remember, you don't know the location of something, you have it all in one file. And also I just wanted another point, Alan, that you mentioned is a recognition event. Many people all of a sudden have a recognition event that they see is coming down the line, a capital gain usually, and they don't want it taxed in New York. And what they do is say the recognition event's going to happen in July, 
they claim the change of domicile is June 15th. And that's a big problem because you really want to make sure there's enough space between your claimed change of domicile date and the recognition event. Because New York may say, you know, we totally agree that you've moved your domicile to Florida. We just don't agree on the date. And one, the first thing that they will um, request in, uh, in an audit and in an information document request is your federal tax returns. Why do they do that? They want to see what they're missing out on, especially if you haven't filed a New York State tax return. They want to see those items that they're losing out on tax. And if they see that recognition item, you better believe they're going to try and make that change of domicile date after the recognition item. And it's on you, again, burden of proof is on you to show that it was, in fact, September, um, June 15th. So why do not create that problem for yourselves. Make sure there's enough buffer. If you can help it, um, sometimes we can't, but make sure there's enough buffer between your date of change of domicile and um, any recognition event. Okay, someone asked the question, it's a good question. If you move out of New York City's border, out of the five boroughs, but still commuting to the city for work, are you... so you live in New York City, you file a tax return for the state and city for multiple years. Now you decide you're going to move out to the Hamptons, right? Happens a lot. How does that wealthy individual extricate themselves from New York City in that 4% city resident tax, even though they commute into the city for work sometimes from the Hamptons? perhaps more than 100 days a year. So again, it's the same It's the same analysis. It's the same five factors. The business one, you're just going to have to show that you do not maintain or the day-to-day -day operations of that business in the city and that you're just a W-2 employee. And your only tie to the city at that point is your commuting in there for, for work purposes and nothing else. Um, it's the same burden on you to show by clear and convincing evidence that you've moved out. The proximity is always a problem, but again, you have to, you know, ensure through good documentation that you're spending a lot of time outside of the city, preferably in, in the if it's the Hamptons in the Hampton area, and you know, joining, you know, any anything in the community and and clubs and organizations and spending your holidays there. And again, that's all document based. All of this is document based. The state can't know what you're doing or where you are without documentation. They will absolutely naturally assume that you haven't moved your domicile or that you're spending more than 183 days um, in, 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 in New York State or the city. Let's go through a couple more of these questions. Someone says, if you're moving out of New York for work and you own a condo in New York City and want to rent it out, what are the tax consequences? I think there, there's something called Schedule E. When you receive income from a tenant, you file Schedule E. It's rental income that you report. It's Schedule E on your tax return. If you file Schedule E, I think, Marissa, you'd agree, that will help you say, hey, I didn't live in that condo. I got income from, from that condo, especially if it's a one bedroom or a place right. where one family is living. Yeah. And again, just keep the lease documents, copies of all lease documents covering the whole period somewhere um, as record. Um, if you move. Oh, so if only someone asked if you move out of New York City, <clears throat> but you're commuting a city, can you still subject to New York City tax? No, New York City tax is only imposed on residents. So if you can show that you no longer a New York City resident, then there's no New York City tax. That's only for New York City residents. Okay. Um, Gay had won his case because he didn't keep his stuff there and it was an occasional use where he stayed with his parents, Robert. That's why he won his case. He was able to show that he wasn't using it as a normal PPA. That's how Gay had won that. Um, the Obis case I discussed that, you know, it's been settled. The state hasn't really come to any type of statutory um, changes to address that. Again, I think it's because the case is so specific on facts and that you have to meet essentially all the facts in order to win on OBIS. Um, like I said, my, my client lived in Massachusetts. Um, his job was in Massachusetts. He had an, a, a, a small place uh, in, in upstate New York somewhere, I think uh, Western New York, actually, it was about six hours away. It was almost identical to Obis, and we were able to win 
um, on that matter. So if, you're, if your situation is such that it's pretty close to obus, not exactly, but super close, you may have a shot. But like I said, if you're New Jersey, work in New York City, and have a Hamptons home and you want to say that's obus, um, in my opinion, you, you will lose. Okay. We've answered most questions on here. Anyone else have any last minute questions or thoughts? Um, I think it's just, you know, education is key. Let's let our clients know what where the risks are so that we start adding credibility in the market. I think it goes a long way um, for a lot of brokers for sure. Right. If you can if you can address issue, you can address it from the onset and be prepared. Um, any possible and, and now also I, I want to stress that doing everything correctly will not prevent an audit from happening. That's beyond anyone's control. Again, remember, the state doesn't know that you did everything correctly. They're just seeing that you are a good customer. Um, there's a tax benefit there for them, you know, an, an income benefit there for them. And they're going to um, inquire and they're going to audit you. And it's on you to make sure that you have all the proper documentation in place so that it goes more seamlessly. You can't go to the state and say, I'm changing my domicile. I did, you know, all five of the factors. Look at this. Please sign on a piece of paper. That's not how it happens. The only way you get a change of domiciles is as a result of an audit, sadly. A certified change of domicile. They may not audit you, but if, if they do, that's the only way you'll get it. Anything else? All right. Oh, someone asked uh, to repeat the app names. Tax Bird, B-I-R-D. Tax Day, D-A-Y. Moneo, M-O-N-E-A-O. -E I have a question. Sure. Um, Hi. Hi, Marissa. You, you just mentioned that you don't get any piece of paper from New York that says you changed your domicile. In advance but, of an audit, correct. Right. Now, when you couple that with the fact that if you don't file a tax return, the statute of limitations never starts running. Correct. What advice would you have for somebody who is changing domicile to do it in the middle of the year, file a return for you know partial residence? Or if you did it at the beginning of, of another year, make sure you have $10 of New York state income, file a return showing $10, and then five, seven years of, later, if New York comes after you, say, sorry, statute of limitations ran, I filed my return. Okay, so first of all, nobody moves January 1st. Nobody moves December 31st. Right. So then oh, someone's always moving where there's a partial year. There's going to be some, some day or two or three or months that are New York. So in that case, you're always going to be filing some type of return, usually. If someone's in the know, understands, and they don't assume that they're moving January 1st and not file for the year. So my piece of advice is to pick a reasonable change of domicile date, not 1231, not 11, file the part year return, and add a schedule stating that your intent is to move your domicile on such and such date. So it puts the state on notice that that was your intent. Again, contemporaneous with the return filing that you're planning to move your domicile out of New York on such and such date. Same goes for statutory residency. If you, fall, if you qualify for the statutory residency test, you're a statutory resident for a given year, add a schedule stating that you're filing a resident tax return because of the statutory residency rules, not because you're claiming or you have any intent of changing your domicile to New York. Because I have audits right now in which clients did not do that. Their tax preparers did not do that. And the state is now trying to claim that they changed their domicile back because they had several years in a row in which they filed as a stat res. So definitely, like I said, documentation is so important. You know, Keeping the state informed of your intent at the time of when you're doing it is important too. But that doesn't always happen. So sadly, you have to then try and Mitigate the damages. Because because very often it's not going to be the case of a part year return. It's going to be a full year because in the first year you might have moved in October to another state and really felt I've changed my domicile, but you're still a statutory resident for that That's year. That's right. It depends on the date date in which you move. Again, 
it, it, it's, it's facts and circumstances dependent. And, and do, you, do you ever see the state going rogue on statutory residence, meaning with no evidence whatsoever that you have a PPA saying, well, you've got the burden of proving to me that of those, you know, two million apartments in New York, you don't have access to any of them. Do they have an ownership to one of them? Nothing. They basically say, no, but you've got, you. there's a lot of money here. You've been a New York resident for a bunch of years. Um, you know, prove to us that you I haven't don't... seen that. No, okay. I haven't seen that. I've seen it where, for instance, there was a client of mine that owned a lot of um, um, investment properties. And one of them happened to be a residential that his ex-wife lived in. And they tried to attribute that to him. And we showed that they had uh, a contentious relationship and he didn't have unfettered access. And obviously he didn't keep his stuff there and he never went there. Um, that was probably the most egregious one I've seen, but I really don't think they come after you unless they have some at least solid reasoning for saying this is your PPA because. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I haven't seen it. All right. Well, Any other questions, thoughts on this great topic before our long Memorial Day weekend? You want me to go through some more in the chat, Alan? Sure. We're running out of time. <laughs> I'll try to address some more. Um, yeah, so. Laura asks, any thoughts if you physically work in two different states in one year, New York and Hawaii, different employers, three to four month jobs at a time. You have to allocate those days to New York, um, worked in New York to New York. So whatever days you worked in New York, you would take those days over the total number of days for the year and that percentage of your income is allocable to New York. If it's different employers, it's only that employer, obviously. If it's a New York employer, it's that employer's income that's taxable to New York. Uh, and I'm not a tax preparer, I'm not an accountant, so I should preface that you should really discuss that with your tax preparer and how that should be handled. Let's see, anybody else? If you live in Florida, but your employer's in New York, you're paying 100% of your employer income to New York State. That is correct. If you live in, um, someone asked, if you live in Florida, but your employer is in New York, you are paying 100% of your employer income to New York State. That is correct. You want to ensure that you either establish a bona fide employer office in your home in Florida, Florida, or that you are part of the Florida office if you want more to exist. What about capital gains and paying New York State taxes? No, that's if you're not a domiciliary of New York or statutory residency, capital gains wouldn't apply. It's employment, that allocation of income in which those rules apply. On the convenience of the employer test, you know, the word sort of circulates that if you're never in the office in New York, not even one day. Some people say a very no, few number of days. They're just not going to tax you. I don't know if that's true or not. That's Is there the Hayes gun? case. Yeah, that's the Hayes case. If you can show that you never came to New York, um, you're signed to the New York office, you live in a different state, you're non-resident, but you have never come to New York in the calendar year for work purposes. Again, you would have to establish that you were not here for work purposes. You can come for personal reasons. Then yeah. you the, the convenience of employer rule does not apply. That's been shown in the Hayes case, H-A-Y-E-S. That's a bright line. If you came even one day for work purposes, forget if you came it. one day, you're, you're, you're stuck. I, I've had those cases where the person came for about 10 days and all of their income was subject to New York tax. Yeah. I mean, there are cases that are, I mean, I think between COVID era cases in Massachusetts and New Hampshire that are percolating their ways up the federal court, there may be something coming from the circuits or from the Supreme Court eventually. Oh, there's not. lots. There, there's several cases going on right now. And, they, and there's many that have been brought that they have lost. So yeah. we'll just have to wait and see. Yep. And then you know what happens? New York State loses and then they just change their statute. Yeah. <laughs> they have Maybe. deep pockets in New York. <laughs> that's really, right. Our clients right, need to know. That, I think that's the key element here. The clients just need to know what's going on. That's right. I think we've met every, uh, we've answered pretty much everything. I apologize if we have um, skipped anything. You can absolutely contact me at any time. You can go to our website, cplawfirm.com. I'll give you my direct number is 212-223-5704. Um, my email, my phone number is on the website, as is Alan's information. 
please feel free to reach out and um, ask any questions that we you didn't put in the chat or that I may have skipped over the chat. I apologize for that. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for everyone joining us today. It's a great conversation. And um, till next time. Right, Alan? Great weekend to everybody. Take yes. care now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.